Senator Ludlam. Uh, thank you very much, President. <clears throat> um, it doesn't give me a great deal of pleasure to rise to speak to this bill, but I want to congratulate my colleague, um, Senator Wish Wilson, for bringing this bill forward. It still leaves me somewhat speechless that behind the scenes the uh, Australian executive through our trade minister, trade senior trade bureaucrats, are negotiating a treaty that would see Australia effectively subordinate state and national law to that of global corporate trade law. And what this bill seeks to do is take on one element of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is being negotiated in secret as we speak, and depending on which rumours you believe, may be as close as two or three weeks away from being signed and then presented to this parliament. This is a trade agreement being signed under cover of total darkness. And isn't it interesting that when the global community gets together to sign and negotiate difficult and complex environmental agreements, they happen out in the open. The negotiators from various parties trying to hammer out climate change agreements have to do that in open forum. And sure, there are deals done in back rooms and all the usual things that go on, but everybody knows what it is that Australia would be potentially signing up to. And when it comes to global trade agreements, not even the minister necessarily knows. I think the first thing that we need to get very clear about, we consider the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's, it's, is that this is not a free trade agreement in the sense that we are used to. And it is not even being negotiated between sovereign governments. It is actually being negotiated between large corporate uh, entities in various sectors. And they, those corporations, whether it be big pharma or rights holders, biotechnology industry, agriculture, take your pick, are then handing negotiating positions to trade negotiators in various countries and having them hammered into a text. This is an agreement being hammered out by global corporations in their benefit. It is an investors' rights agreement. It is not a free trade agreement. The little that we know about the actual text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we only know because whistleblowers have leaked draft chapters of the text, two um, iterations of the IP chapter, one iteration uh, of uh, the chapter relating to environmental protection, to the WikiLeaks website. And while that organisation has been hammered from all quarters, it has never been proven to be more important than now as the place where we can go to find out exactly what is being done in our name. So I congratulate Senator Wish Wilson for bringing forward this very targeted bill. It obviously doesn't go to the entire scope of the Trans-Pacific Partnership because nobody will tell us exactly what that is. But it does go to the very specific notion of investor state dispute mechanisms. One of those acronyms that might make your eyes glaze over until you realise that what it allows to happen would be for multinational corporations to sue sovereign governments. Now, this parliament considers itself sovereign. And I know from personal experience that the mob at the Tent Embassy uh, and around the country, traditional owners have, would take a very strong issue with that, that the business of sovereignty in this country is probably the most important piece of unfinished business for us to confront. But the fact is uh, that in the prayers that were just read in, and you would assume that those from uh, all sides of this parliament come in here, charged with making and amending laws and providing good governance in the interests of everyone across this continent. Now, what happens if the laws that we pass in here are found to be offensive to the profit-generating activities of corporations on the other side of the world? That the Australian government, as is actually occurring, although I'm not sure many people are aware of it, could be dragged into a tribunal of unelected foreign trade bureaucrats and sued and forced to amend the affecting regulation if it impinges on the profits of a company on the other side of the world. It sounds insane, but that is in fact precisely what is being negotiated behind closed doors by the Australian government and when they were in government by the Australian Labor Party. One of the things that I hope, whether it's Senator Carr or whoever speaks on behalf of the Labor Party will do when, he's, when uh, they are given the opportunity is actually put some cards on the table and make it very clear where the ALP stands. As my understanding uh, is that they would be in support of Senator Wish Wilson's bill. Um, when they were in government, I think they did have form of opposing investor state dispute 
mechanisms that would allow state or federal governments to be sued by corporations who found themselves offended. But it is not at all clear where they stand now. So I think um, that is another reason um, why I'd like to thank Senator Wish Wilson for bringing this debate forward today. Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel laureate in economics and somebody who spends a fair bit of time thinking about these things, said the following. The Trans-Pacific Partnership proposes to freeze into a binding trade agreement many of the worst features of the worst laws in the TPP countries, making needed reforms extremely difficult, if not impossible. The investor state dispute resolution mechanisms should not be shrouded in mystery to the general public, while the same provisions are routinely discussed with advisers to big corporations. None of this is being done in the national interest. This is an agreement being hammered out in the corporate interest. If somebody as esteemed in his field as Professor Stiglitz is of that view, we should take that very, very seriously. We are fortunate, as I said, to those um, staff, uh, campaigners and journalists in the publishing organisation WikiLeaks for having the bravery to have stayed in business despite the extraordinary persecution that's been meted out to them so that we do have some sense of what is in the IP chapters. And there are some very specific concerns. I want to concentrate today mostly uh, on an area that's very dear to me. Um, areas around freedom of information, freedom of speech, digital rights, which are placed explicitly under threat by what we find contained in the IP chapter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also what happens when you bring investor-state dispute mechanisms to bear on some of these issues. A lot of damage was done when Australia signed the US-Australia-US the Australia -US Free Trade Agreement, and I think it has been government policy to try and avoid, if possible, forcing any amendments into domestic law um, as a result of the IP chapter. It is not at all clear whether that's actually the case, that we may be faced with a bill which we will be told on a take-it-or-leave-it basis that this parliament has to pass. I would also say for those who may be following this debate from outside and may be a bit confused by the government's rhetoric of due process that we have the Treaties Committee that is designed to evaluate mechanisms like the TPP. The fact is I served on the Treaties Committee for five and a half years, nearly six years, that committee will not get a copy of the Trans-Pacific Partnership until after the government signs it. And while the committee, uh, in my experience, does apply a very critical eye to these things, the government is not bound to accept any of its recommendations. So the Treaties Committee will do um, the best that it can, but the agreement will already have been signed. Trade Minister, Prime Minister's signatures will already be on the document by the time Australia's accountability mechanisms and oversight mechanisms get a chance to take a look at it. And then it will be a case <clears throat> of this parliament being told, effectively with a gun to its head, that it has to pass the enabling legislation to bring some of these provisions into force. What an utterly backwards and antiquated process for dealing with such an important issue. So we have already done a certain amount of damage in Australian law. We effectively imported some of the worst aspects of US IP law without their protections. The US have um, fair use clauses, which mean you can't be prosecuted under US intellectual property law uh, for doing stuff that's quite clearly not impinging on profits, you know, commercial scale piracy and that kind of stuff. Uh, in Australia, the situation is very much unclear, and it appears that the, US, uh, that the uh, Trans Pacific Partnership, from what we know of the IP chapters, will make that situation much worse. And that's my principal question of what's the rush in bringing in mandatory data retention legislation. Not necessarily so that the federal police can go and prosecute people who are found to be file sharing, but so that rights holders from the US and elsewhere can go and trawl your metadata records of your teenage kids and send them threatening legal letters uh, and the threat of gargantuan fines uh, unless um, they pay up, or lengthy um, court processes unless they pay enormous fines. That is the kind of world that we are potentially stepping into here. The document, as it stands, contains disproportionate and inappropriate enforcement provisions. It is all about enforcing the rights of rights holders, most of them from overseas. And there is nothing at all about public interest protections. So just to give you one example, a couple of years ago, the Australian Law Reform Commission 
partly in response, actually, to some of the damaging provisions that we embedded in Australian law after the US, Australia US Free Trade Agreement was brought about. The Australian Law Reform Commission conducted quite a detailed inquiry <clears throat> into the copyright regime that prevails here in Australia. And one of the recommendations that they made at the time was to bring fair use provisions, so effectively import some of the protective measures that exist in US law. We, had the, we got the punitive stuff. We don't have the protective provisions. And the, the fact is that if we were to now do so, if we sign up to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which then embeds all kinds of property rights that didn't exist before for the rights holders, if this parliament then decided to do as the Australian Law Reform Commission recommended and institute a fair use regime, that could be struck down by unelected trade bureaucrats in a tribunal. And Australia, the Australian government might choose to not even contest what would likely be a very expensive and extensive arbitral process. So it may be that under Attorney General George Brandis, who is quite clearly only listening to the rights holders, might not even decide to contest it. It is that chilling effect on domestic legislation that is such an important and terrifying part of what this government is negotiating behind the scenes. Extension of, top of copyright terms looks like that's in the agreement as well, which effectively just takes material out of the public domain for decades. It makes the work of cultural institutions and collection agencies that much harder, and it robs us of our own culture. Copyright term extension sounds arcane, but basically it just means all this rich cultural material simply going dark. Archival institutions not even being able to digitise or make copies of material that in analog form is degrading or being lost. So we have a very significant problem, and it's one that this parliament will not be able to address until it is far too late. So I think one of the simplest things that we could do would be to bring forward this bill for a vote today and pass into Australian domestic law protections against any Australian government signing us up to investor state dispute mechanisms. If you're concerned about fracking, if you're concerned about uh, advertising tobacco products in places where kids can see it, if you're concerned about uh, you know, a ban on uranium mining, for example, or any of those issues where communities come into collision with powerful corporate interests, whether it be tobacco, big pharma, genetically modified organisms in our food, the fracking industry, take your pick. Anywhere these major collisions between the corporate interest and the public interest are underway, these very same corporations are seeking that power to sue us, to sue this parliament, to sue state parliaments. And nobody on the government side of this chamber will make eye contact this morning because they haven't read the agreement either. They have no idea what's in it. They just hear from our trade bureaucrats, it's fine, we're looking after the national interest, it's a free trade agreement like nothing you've ever seen before. Well, at least that part is true. But we owe it to ourselves, to our constituents and to the future flexibility of this legislature to be able to do its job, to protect ourselves from predator capitalism and from these corporate interests unelected on the other side of the world who would like nothing more than to subordinate the lawmaking power of this chamber and the other place to their own interests. Because all you would need to prove, or not even really prove, all you would need to be able to show is that your future potential profits in fracking underneath a residential subdivision or farmland, your future potential profits in opening up a carcinogenic uranium mine, or your future profits in being able to track down and prosecute um, teenagers bit torrenting stuff that they can't get any other way to be able to sue a government, to sue this parliament. So I hope that we will see a measured, intelligent, evidence-based debate on this this morning. I hope that the Labor Party will come clean with the Australian population about what its policy actually is. We will be listening beyond words and we will be looking for a voting intention. And I hope the government might want to stand up and maybe even table a draft of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's not a serious expectation, but how about it? If this document is so benign, if it's in the public interest, if it's going to lead to a massive increase in GDP, if it's going to be a huge benefit to our agricultural sector or whoever else you think you're out there negotiating on behalf of, then put it into the daylight. 
Let's see the document. Let's see what it is that's being negotiated in our names behind closed doors. This bill should pass into law and it won't solve many of the issues contained in the Trans-Pacific Partnership if this government is so reckless as to sign on. We will have to fight that through this parliament and in the community. But once these agreements are signed, they are perilously difficult to unravel. They are impossible to wind back because we will have granted property rights effectively across all of our collective futures to these corporations that only care about property rights and the profit motive. And it is our job, I think, to protect the public interest, not the commercial interest and the corporate interest. Our job in here today is to protect the public interest. So I look forward to a resolution of this matter so that we can send this bill to the other place for assent and protect ourselves from making potentially one of the most reckless and dangerous mistakes any parliament could make, which is to handcuff itself from its future legislative obligations to the people of this country.